Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Friday Live reading for July 3rd. I am excited today to have with us uh, Melissa Mary Duncan. She, there she is, uh, and <laughs> who's going to be working on a beautiful piece for us uh, during the show, uh, Daniel Cowper and Christine Perron. So first off, uh, I'm just going to bring Melissa on large screen so we can see what she's working on. So, oops. We'll have a minute of soupiness. There we go. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, a little bit of background. Uh, Melissa is a fantasy artist and illustrator. Uh, she lives in New Westminster with her husband, the author DVS Duncan. She's a historic reenactor and Neo Edwardian wishful thinker. And she has a passion for life, learning, and the creative process. And she has numerous solo exhibitions. Her arts found homes in private collections from Japan to Great Britain. And her book, Faye, The Art of Melissa Mary Duncan, was released in 2013 and is available on her website. So we've had many, many um, covers done by her, our, including our very first cover. Um, which was uh, the Beer Fairy, and the fifth cover, which was Fondly Remembered Magic. Uh, we then had her on issue 12 with uh, the storyteller, and um, what I'm, and issue 21 as well, which was our Frost and the Frost and Snow. And of course, what I am most thrilled about is that she has been the cover artist for both of my novels, uh, Elena Song Overture and Elena Song Area. And what she's working on today is the cover for the third book. So, uh, and there you can see her hand at work. So, welcome, Melissa. Hello. Uh, good morning. <laughs> Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, we can see this pencil and we're going to bring you back periodically, but I'm going to let you work for a while while I announce the long list for the Hummingbird Prize. So our Hummingbird um, Flash Fiction Prize closed in June. We read all those stories and came up with a long list. And here are the names of the authors who have stories that have past the first hurdle. So we have in alphabetical order by first name, Adrian Markle, Andrew Moore twice, Cadence Mandibura twice, Candace Kubinek, Cheryl Scori Suma, Dana Storino, Epiphany Farrell. That's a that's a, an author we had on this show just a <laughs> week or two ago. And Hannah Van Didden, who was also on this show a couple, a couple of weeks ago. Jack Smiles, Jade Williams, Joshua Moody, Casey Newberry, Carrie Craven, who won the Raven contest back in 2017, Kimberly Aslett, Laura Kuhlman, Lauren Savage, Margaret Jameson, Margot Spronk, who's appeared in a couple of issues, uh, Maria Marchese, Patrick Dawson, Robert A. Runte, who uh, was a runner up for the Hummingbird a couple of years ago. Uh, Soramime Hanarejima, who we've also published and is actually coming up in uh, in the fall issue as well. Steven Simonchik, Susie Samant, and Tristan Mirage. So congratulations to all these authors. Um, we are not publishing the names of the stories yet because they are with our final judge, uh, Bob Thurber, and we don't want to prejudice him unduly. So congratulations to all of you. All right. So, oh, I'm seeing color going on now. So what are you doing now, Melissa? Well, I'm just laying in a wash um, on some of the background here uh, for some areas that will be sort of bluish. Nice. And is that watercolor? It's watercolor. I primarily work in watercolor. I used to work a lot in egg tempera, but um, I used to make my paint, so that was a whole lot of work and uh that is a lot of work yeah so yeah 
I used to distill the pigments and it was a wonderful process. I loved it dearly. I had apprentices, so that made it easier. And, uh, but uh, times changed and I got hooked on watercolor. Yeah. Well, you've got an amazingly sure hand. I love watching you work. You just, it's just, you can watch the drawing just come to life under your hand. So, um, so what I'm going to do now is we're going to leave you to work there. And okay, okay. I am going to bring on our, one of our poetry editors, our first poetry editor, uh, Daniel Cowper. Oops. And oh, I thought I had a, I thought I had an image of his book, but I don't. So we're just going to bring on his chat mm -hmm. book. <laughs> so, um, Daniel Cowper, um, he is a longtime poetry editor for Pulp Literature. His own poetry has appeared in literary publications in Canada, the US, and Ireland. And in 2017, his poetry was long listed for the CBC Poetry Prize. Um, he's the author of uh, The God of Doors, which you see there on the left of the screen, which won the Frog Hollow Press Chatbook Contest, and Grotesque Tenderness, which is a collection of poetry that came out last year by McGill Queen's University Press. Oh, good, you've got the cover there. <laughs> it's a wonderful cover. I love that. You can see that cover on our title screen for the show, so it is up there. So welcome, Dan. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Good. So I thought I would read two poems that I've written uh, relatively recently. Like a lot of people in April, I read some things that I had been meaning to get around to for a long time. And one of the things that I dipped in and out of was The Golden Legend, which is a book of medieval saints' lives. Um, all pretty speculative work, actually. Um, kind of a medieval, um, a medieval bit of superheroes and miracles and uh, superpowers and things like that. But um, I wrote a little poem called The Plague Saints about a couple of the saints from that book who uh, who are venerated um, by Catholics um, in connection with, with plagues and the recovery from plagues. Oh, strangers, reading saints' lives makes me long to take your cares away. Like Christ pulling darts off St. Sebastian, or a mum plucking leeches from her baby's skin, my hands, like their hands, smoothing plumes of blood away. I know I'm no saint, I'm not your mother. If I tried to yank an arrow out, the buried barbs would slice membranes and veins. I'd do twice more harm than good. St. Rock nursed plague victims until he sickened too, he went solo to the forest outside Rome. He lay dying in a hutch of branches when Christ and his baying pack passed by hunting men's souls through the beechwood. Dogs poured into the saints lean-to, lapped black sores in armpits and groin while Christ waited outside, bored, slinging pebbles through skins of leaves. Sorry, now I've made you uneasy with talk of saints and Christ. Forgive me. I meant to please you with the bright colors of immaculate love. Oh, stranger, you are no plague saint either. Take care. Whatever we try, you and I, we hurt more than we heal. That is beautiful. Thank you, Jen. I love that, and and what a great inspiration for for poetry to to look at you know those medieval stories, which yeah, as you say, are really science fiction um, of the day. So, uh, I, and that was just um, it was quite moving the the imagery there of you know doing more harm than good as you as you pull the arrows out. Yeah, I think one of the strange things about um, this time that we're still in partly, but it was even more acute a month or two ago is that we were being asked to help each other by staying away from each other as much as possible. Um, the only way we could help was by 
in action and knowing that some people will be hurt and because they don't receive help that they need. Um, yeah, it's a very strange, it was a strange time. Yeah, it's a dichotomy for sure. And, and it was, it was quite hard on people psychologically, I think. I think we're still feeling that. Yeah, Bonnie Henry, our public health officer here in BC, said that there was there has been a spike in suicides uh, during the, during the time of social isolation, and um, that's it's a it's a terrible tragedy. And every single one of those people who died who didn't have to die, you know, they're a cost that that they're a cost that the rest of us seem to have accepted for the avoidance of a larger tragedy, but it's, um, it is awful. And they needed, you know, everybody, everybody who was subject to domestic abuse or mental illness during that time, they weren't able to get help. It's just, uh, you know, there's no consolation for them. So it's just, it's a, it's a dark time, I guess. <laughs> it is. <laughs> there's a lot, it is. there's a lot that's lovely in it too. So yeah. I'll stop, I'll stop mulling over the, <laughs> the things that are bad and I'll, I'll try to read another poem uh, that I wrote about uh, sort of about a saint, about St. Augustine who wrote a great piece of literature called the confessions uh, in which he talks about his life. And one thing that he talks about is his time before uh, he converted and became a Catholic saint when he was a manichae, just to say uh, a member of a, a Gnostic cult that believed that there was this, secret knowledge about um, good and evil in the world and how those two principles were balanced. And one of the things that he describes is at the meetings, they would have their priests eat vegetable, like a vegetable life, like plums, for example, he talks about. And then they would breathe out the souls of the plums and the sort of ghost would come out of their mouth. Um, the ghost of the plum. So I, uh, wrote a poem about mind and body and spirit and body called twin earth viewed from the seashore. And the, um, the idea that is partly drawn from Augustine and partly drawn from a very old idea that there was a, a parallel earth on the opposite side of the sun that you can't see because it's hidden from us, but it balances the universe. I detour along the pebbled beach, avoiding the quick route home. Tidal foam froths to nothing, recalling again what I'd read as Bullet Cafe closed, Augustine's thoughts on Manichaean rites, whose priests, called perfects, ate plums, exhaled the droops digested souls and wraiths of smoke, while devotees cheered, soul's truth, Life of, be life of bodies. I was troubled by the saint's belief these miracles were real, and how you've said you believe in souls but not life after death. Crows pick at drying rack. Sanderlings chase the retreating strip of popping suds, tonguing amphipods from seething stones. If birds had creeds, what doctrines would they preach? On earth, I imagine the birds might say, all things are birds, droplets, speckling glass or silver birds, bloody masks on feasting wolves are birds, falling stars are cosmic birds who clatter down on empty plateaus like exhausted migrators. With sudden flux, as if psilocybin were in my veins, I see black dots above the setting sun ladder in sequence and hear crows and shorebirds call out in alarm look the birdless world that lurks behind the sun is showing through twin earth where nerves run inputs outputs without souls inside to smear with smell of feather wax or fright without paired minds to bell with song its image loomed and enlarged by some celestial mirage, twin earth turns, displaying mindless landscapes like our own until its fresh edge exposes leaves. 
huge leaves piercing that globe's blue envelope of air. One tree comes into view, its roots overrunning a continent and rearing buds and leaves so high that waves of cosmic birds can brush against and perforate their skins, slaking the need that shivers in all cells. And all the crows and sanderlings and I combined in prayer, crying to the force who fuses mind to flesh, bless this tree, this monument to beings thirst for birds, bless the sow bugs and slugs within its scalds, each fungus interwoven with its rhizome. Spare them the finitude of soulless melusines and mermaids from perishing when mortal atoms are replaced with essences incapable of death. On new twin earth, let this tree be honeycombed with hatchlings in foramina and crotches, bark maculate where beaks tap for sap. Let boughs cacophony with rainbow flocks of parrots in chartreuse shade, let raptors clutch the backs of wailing rats. Let serpents glut the crops of wattled storks. The sun and twin earth sank from sight. Phalanxes of shorebirds crisped to wing. Days foraging being done, crows coalesced on the wooded bite. I sit stunned on a log, pitying a world of flesh simpliciter and longing for your hug, your skin. Back at the house you wait, my love, writing, sipping tea, or sucking chocolate chips. In you repose both flesh and soul, a braid of clockwork and living birds, a creature full of life and waiting nests of eggs. Oh, that was incredible. Um... I, I think of your poetry, it's like Celtic knotwork or uh, illuminations in manuscripts. It's intricate and intertwined and, and yet um, natural and flowing at the same time. It's just, uh, I, I, it's incredibly skillfully done and, and you make it look easy, but I know it's not. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. It's... Um... That second poem in particular, I've spent a lot of time working on. It's hard to talk about, you know, mind-body dualism and to use the idea of a twin planet and to use the idea of the birds um, having their own theology and having the idea and the idea of the... Um, um, of the manichees and all that. There's a lot of things that most people aren't familiar with. And so it's difficult to weave them together into a poem that's at all accessible. And we've, we've so got, still working on it. Well, it's, it's wonderful. And yeah, you've done it, like I said, very skillfully. Uh, uh, Genevieve Wynand, who's one of our editors, just uh, posted incredible pieces, Daniel. And uh, another one of our editors posted uh, Jessica Fabricius posted, I really enjoy that parallel to humans' desire to anthropomorphize everything but with birds. So, so. Oh, well, thank you for that. Stay on till the end in case there are more questions. Um, just going to take a quick look at uh, what Melissa is up to now. And I see some more colors have gone on there, some yellow um, in addition to the blue. And... Uh, just a reminder to the audience that you can post your questions on the YouTube chat and Mel is sitting backstage. She's going to pass them on to us and I will ask them of our authors. So now I want to bring on um, our second reader for the day, Christine Perrin. So Christine is, uh, is an author, but she's also a former stunt woman, so she has been shot, stabbed, drowned, run over, and thrown from a building in her career. Uh, she's learned all the interesting ways a person can get injured or die, and then she applies this unique technique to her fiction. Um, her story, Flavor of the Forsaken, appeared in issue 20. Uh, she's also the co-author of the adventure science fiction series Warp World, which was the and she was the 2010 winner of the Surrey International Writers Conference Storyteller Award and a 2015 Writers of the Future finalist. 
Uh, you can also find her fiction in Escape Pod, Denizens of Darkness, Canadian Storyteller Magazine, The Barbaric Yop, and Hemispheres Magazine. And her friends wish she would stop talking about cats. That's not true. Everybody likes to hear about cats. Welcome, Christy. Hi, Jen. Actually, that is true. Everybody does like to hear about cats. Well, most people. Um, so give us a little rundown on your story, and then uh, let's have a reading from this amazing uh, piece, Flavor of the Forsaken. Sure. So this story came about for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to write about food. I discovered cooking late in life and uh, was enamored with it. And then the bigger purpose behind this story was I've spent a lot of years traveling and living and working in other countries and places that people generally have some prejudices about or biases or are in general fearful of and um, my experiences didn't mask that or didn't match that so what I wanted to do was write about what happens when you go to a place uh, and you meet the people that you're you've been scared of or you have biases about and you find out what they're really all about so that's where this story came from and I will begin Flavor of the Forsaken. You're going to end up bleeding in the gutter. Pempus Sigle heard the words of his dearest friend as he rolled to one side and wiped the blood from his face. No gutter. They had taken him out to the alley to beat him senseless. Only crimson mud, urine, and old wash water here. You were wrong, he wheezed and then started to cry. Empty pockets. He knew before he even found the strength to search, but he searched anyway, his fingers digging down to the very corners, pulling out only wet lint and mushy crumbs. After separating the crumbs from the lint, he forced them through swollen lips and onto his tongue. Sweet Haval sugar and the barest tint of sharpness, fresh morning mint. The mint would have been picked before sunrise, before the sun licked the moisture from the leaves. His mother had taught him how to find the best morning mint in the market, to look for the leaves that had not curled at the edges. They get everything? Pempasigle opened his eyes. He had not realized he'd closed them and saw a pair of heavy boots inches away. He followed the boots up to a heavy leather long coat, up to a head as big as a large pumpkin, up to a pair of yellow eyes, up to a shock of muddy green hair, up to a set of horns sweeping from back to front in an S curve, up to a prang. Before he could answer, the prang's mouth twisted. Yeah, they got everything. Go home, city. The boots departed in a slurp and suck of mud. A prang. Unthinkable, unclean. But what other options were left to him? Wait, Pempasigle called. Pain of all varieties flared and throbbed and stabbed as he clawed his way to hands and knees. The cursed ground did its best to hold him, but he yanked his hands free and stood, shaking his arms to rid himself of the crimson slop. Wait! The boots did not pause. The woman wearing the boots did not look back. Woman would not have been his guess if he had not seen her the day before. Not exactly woman, either. Prangs could be male or female or both or neither. Pempasigle did not know. He had never seen a real prang before yesterday. I need your help, he called. The boots walked on, turned a corner, and disappeared. And I'm going to jump to the next section.
In the time it had taken Pempasigle to extract himself from the mud and limp after the prang, she had wandered into a cook shack. The cook shack smelled more of compost than cuisine. By the time he forced down bodily complaints and worked up the courage to step inside, she had eaten half a plate of fat insects and was on a second mug of something green. Of course, she had taken a table at the farthest corner of the room, making his crossing a public spectacle and his bedraggled appearance the subject of unfriendly comments and snickers. He pointed to the single unoccupied chair across from the prang. Do you mind if she kicked the chair hard? He yelped as it bounced off his knee and tumbled to a stop several feet away. The prang snatched one of the insects from the plate and scraped the meat from its belly with a thick yellow fingernail. All the while, Makineng's voice chittered in his head. What are you thinking? Was it not enough to lose your savings? To have those men beat and humiliate you? Go to your room, grab your things, and catch the next train out of here. No, he had not come this far to give up. He spread his hands. Won't you at least? No, the prang said. But I can no. Please. She sucked meat and juice off the end of her finger and then took a swig of the green liquid. Apparently no other answer was forthcoming. I can make you rich. He spat out the words as quickly as his mouth would allow before she could cut him off. She lowered the mug and met his eyes for the first time. At last he had her attention. Her gaze moved from head to toe and then toe to head. Leaning back in the chair, she crossed her arms over her broad chest. Pempasigle smiled hopefully. Then she laughed. She started to laugh and he laughed along with her. Her chest shook and she pounded her heavy fist on the table as the volume and intensity of her laugh swelled. Her whole body shuddered now, and he thought he saw tears in the corners of her eyes. When she started gasping for breath, he seized the moment to retrieve the fallen chair and pull up to the table before she could boot it away again. I have a plan, he said. Her mo mirth was not finished, however. Gaffaz subsided to chuckles, but then flared up again until the prang wiped at her eyes. If you can help me, I'll a hand as thick as a slab of prime steak and as leathery as bush meat slapped down on Pempasigle's hand and pinned it to the table. Try as he might, he could not pull free of the grip. The prang's laughter ceased and she leaned forward with a face full of menace. Why are you so stupid? She asked. A hundred responses leapt to his defense. Mouth open, he looked into the prang's face. He wondered how old she was. Lines cut into her muddy brown skin reminded him of the deep ravines he had seen on a three-dimensional map in the Saginaw Museum. The strength in her hand, however, spoke of youth and vitality. But it was what he saw in her eyes that called back the speech perched on the edge of his tongue. Why are you so sad? He asked. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> that is a lovely reading. Um, and uh, yeah, you surprised me there. That you changed a few words here and there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, it's great. Reading on the fly. <laughs> no, no, no. That's great. Um, and uh, it, it's lovely to hear it to hear it read out loud. Just um, it makes it so much richer. Um, I have a question from the audience, uh, which uh, is: Which is scarier, stunts or submissions? <laughs> Oh, submissions. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> no question there. Um, and then I had another question um, from uh, Jessica Fabricius. Love, love, love flavor of the Forsaken and cats. 
I really enjoy the names you crafted for the story. Where did they come from? Ooh, good question. It's been a while. Um, so I, I love Google Translate. <laughs> and so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take some words, translate them into another language and, uh, and then play with putting two different languages together. And so I think, uh, I can't remember exactly what the returns were that I got, but Pempa Sigle was something along the lines of um, traveler and new uh, translated into various languages and then mashed together. And then for something like the prang, I just went with a word that sounded nasty because that's <laughs> tends to be what we, you know, what we do with cultures that we don't know and don't understand. We just give them really nasty sounding names. So I'm sure that she has her own word for herself. Right. Oh, well, that's, that's a really great technique using Google Translate to, uh, that's, uh, I might steal that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, um, and uh, Alana Kreider just said, uh, very enjoyable reading. Thank you. So I'm just going to bring Melissa back onto the stage so we can see how um, see how the painting's going, but stick around uh, and we'll have you all back on in a minute. Hi, Melissa. Hello. I see that some lips have been filled in and the laces are getting darker. I mean, I don't know if anybody else is as excited as I am over this painting, but I think it's, <laughs> I, I am, I'm seeing my characters come to life under your hand and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very thrilling. Um, it's always lovely to see somebody else interpret your words. Um, it's always a challenge. You, you don't want to be too literal. You don't want to be too, um, I want to be faithful yeah. and try and um, meet, meet, meet your vision and my vision from reading it halfway. Yeah, I like that. And I like that. Um, I like that you're, it's not, um, it, it, that it doesn't, because I illustrated the first book and I'm glad that your, your paintings don't match my illustrations. So it's, it's nice to have, you know, fresh eyes and fresh hands on it. Because well, whenever, whenever, whenever you read something, when you read a book, your own imagination colors in what you see. That's right. Your life experience. So. All right. I think well, that's, that's I, why reading and books are so intimate. They are. They are. It's, it's, it's very private. Much more private than movies or comic books or anything like that. Yeah. Um, Bringing our other authors back onto the stage as well. Um, uh, Jen Wynand had a question for Daniel. How do you know when a poem is done, are they ever, and ready for the world? I think they tend to be done for now rather than done done. Um, lots of poets will revise a poem over the course of their career so that a poem might appear in a version in a magazine and then a version in a book and then a version in a selected poems and then a final version for a collected poems when they think they might not have any more chances to edit the poem. Um, Yeats famously rewrote his first three or four books, I think, almost completely yeah. 20 or 30 years after they were published. Um, so I think there's a, there's a, it's fair to say like, okay, I can't make this any better right now, or I can't see how to make it any better. It's sort of passed beyond my powers at the moment. Um, and you put it and you, you put it out there in the world and maybe you come back to it later and you think, oh, okay, I can't, I don't need to do anything else with this. Or maybe you think, oh, I can make that now I can make this better, but that's, um, as the opportunity comes up. So if you have a book coming out, then you have an opportunity to rethink the poems, even if they've been previously published. Yeah, that's that's a nice way of looking at it. It's it's as good as it is for now, and I think that's true of, of books as well as poetry. I mean, you get it to a point where you can't make it any better, and then you either put it into somebody else's hands, or or leave it in a drawer, or you know, put it out into the universe as is. 
Um, and oh, uh, a few more comments from the audience. Um, Jessica Fabricius said to Melissa, wow, wow, I've only ever seen finished covers. This must be fun for uh, J.M. Landles to witness. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> And uh, Alana Kay says, how cool to watch you create a book cover. So um, it has been delightful to watch this coming. I'm, I'm, it's like, I, I don't want to turn the cameras off. I just, I, I'm, I'm gripped by watching this come to life. But I, we are at the end of our time and even over time. So thank you, everybody, for your readings and your artwork. And uh sharing your your words and your process with us uh we wish you all the best in in the rest of this pandemic our pandemic reading series is coming to a close soon um only because i need to take a break from it but uh it may come back in the fall we've got another two episodes to come so to our audience we'll see you at the same time next week and uh to our authors and artists Thank you again and stay well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah.